So, so sometimes psychology does these things where a bunch of scientists get together and crunch a bunch of data and then they discover what's completely obvious to everybody else. And in this case, they discovered something that they call nature therapy, which is basically if you go spend time in nature, particularly forests or around water, your symptoms of anxiety and depression will decrease. Surprise, surprise. It's almost like our species was evolved to be around green stuff. I just think having a good relationship with nature, it's like baseline healthiness, essentially. It's something that I probably don't do enough, especially living in New York City. When you come somewhere so beautiful, take advantage of it. You know, it's funny, until Freud, like nobody actually sat down and ever talked about their problems. It's actually a very like recent thing in human history that people will sit down in front of another human being and open up about everything that they're worried about or stressed about. So? You know, once therapy kind of gained some traction, a few decades later, some interesting things started to happen. Therapists were like the first people in, in human history who would hear from hundreds and hundreds of other people about what they were going through and what they were struggling with. And obviously, when you start speaking to hundreds of people and hearing about their problems, you start noticing patterns. And some of these early psychologists started grouping these patterns. They started seeing them as like stages of life. And one of the first ones was a guy named Eric Erickson. I think he had eight stages. And he saw each stage as like there was kind of an internal conflict or tension with each stage. So for instance, like a young child has an internal conflict of negotiating their independence from the authority of, say, their parents. You know, where, where does their, their parents' desires end and their own desires begin? And then once they figure that out, they go out into the world, they start making friends, and suddenly it's, you know, the teenager's internal conflict is their own independence versus their peer group. If I want to play soccer and everybody else wants to play basketball, like, what does that say about me? And are people going to like me? Am I a good person? Am I a cool person? Hey. So that's kind of like the internal conflict of like the adolescent years. You know, all these psychologists, they, they started coming up with these different models, different stages. If you read about them, they're, they're all basically saying the same thing. I tend to think of it as kind of four stages of life. And the way I see it is there are four different periods of our life that we enter and exit that kind of determine what our values are, what we choose to give a fuck about, you could say. Stage one, I would call the mimicry stage, or as the philosopher Rene Girard calls it, mimesis. It's basically like humans, we copy each other, right? There's no really original ideas anymore. We see somebody else doing something cool, we want to do it too. And it turns out that this is like a fundamental part of our psychology and our development. Because it's as children, it's how we learn to live. You know, we learn how to talk by mimicking the sounds that we hear our parents make. We learn how to play games by mimicking what the other kids are doing. So all of our motor functions, our language skills, a lot of our knowledge, and a lot of things that we care about based on mimicry, based on achieving some standards set by others. And for a lot of us, this goes on well into late adolescence, early adulthood. If you think about the person who is, they go to school and they want to be a doctor because that's what their parents want them to be. Or if they want to be a lawyer because all their, their friends are going to law school. This is the first stage of life. This is mimicry. And obviously there's a tension to that because on the one hand, you get the approval and validation of the people around you. But on the other hand, you're having to give up your own desires and your own needs. So the second stage, I just call it exploration. Once we've kind of mimicked what the people around us do and we've had some success with it, or maybe we've been denied, we start wondering, what do I want? How am I different from everybody else? What can I do that's different than everybody else? And so there's a, like this, this intense desire to differentiate yourself from everyone else around you. In some cases, this is by being more successful than other people. Sometimes it's by doing a bunch of weird, wacky shit. Sometimes it's by being more original or creative than everybody else. But basically this is, this is the desire to experience and express your individuality. And this generally happens for people in their early adulthood. If you look at people in their 20s, you know, they're trying out different careers. Maybe they spend a year abroad. They date a bunch of different types of people. They don't really know what they want. They're exploring life and trying to define an identity for themselves. I guess the inherent tension with exploration, there's kind of a diminishing returns to it, right? Like I can travel to all these amazing places in the world, but the more I travel, the less interesting and exciting each subsequent trip will be. And the problem with exploration is that there's no stability. 
To constantly experience newness and novelty, you have to give up a rootedness. You have to give up consistency in your life. So whereas the problem with stage one is that you don't really know your own individual identity, the problem with stage two is that you have no stability in your life. And that leads us into stage three. Once you've explored the world, you've discovered a lot of experiences for yourself, you've met a bunch of people, you come to stage three, you decide to make commitments. You decide to commit to a place to live, commit to a career, commit to a person, commit to a family. Initially, these, these commitments are very scary. You're giving up the opportunity to explore more. You're giving up possibilities that you could potentially have. But the commitment stage is really like when we come to realize that if you're really going to do anything important or worthwhile in this world, you have to spend a lot of time and energy on it. Like if you're going to make an impact, you have to dedicate decades to it. And you can't be distracted by fun and wild and crazy stuff all over the place. Sometimes I, I refer to like that, that ability to commit to something in a lot of ways, that is arriving at adulthood. You know who you are, you know what you stand for, you know what you care about, and you've organized your life in such a way to optimize for it. So the fourth stage of life, I just call it legacy. So when you've spent decades and decades committed to something, achieving something with your life, building a family, building a career, maybe get a building named after you, maybe you write a book, something else kicks in when you start to get old. That is, you wanna preserve the importance of what you've done with your life, you know? So if you experience a lot of success in your career, you wanna make sure that those things are gonna stick around after you pass on. I'm a huge fan of Winston Churchill, and he had a great quote. He said that if you're not liberal when you're 20, you have no heart. If you're not conservative when you're 40, you have no brain. And it's sure enough, a lot of Scientific research shows that people become more conservative the older they get. That's because of stage four. Because once you start accomplishing all these things, once you've made your mark in the world, once you accumulate a lot of power, you want to make sure that it matters, that it sticks around, that even though you're getting old and decrepit and you can't keep up anymore, that the things that you did last longer than you do. So why, why do we care about the four stages? Well, I think there's two reasons. The first is that I just know that when I read this genre of psychology, it makes me a little bit more accepting of myself. It helps me understand like where my motivations come from, where my values come from. And the best part about understanding the stage that you're at, it kind of frees you to be unapologetic about it. If you're exploring, man, fucking explore. Don't apologize for it. That's where you are in life right now. And not everybody's gonna understand that because maybe they're at stage three or at stage one. If you're at stage three, give it your all. Commit everything to what matters to you. And yeah, your stage two friends will miss you at the parties, but you've moved on, your priorities have changed. But the second thing, and I'd say arguably the, the most important thing, is that it makes us more understanding of each other. You know, we're not always in the same stage at the same time. And sometimes we slip back to previous stages. Maybe you get divorced, lose your job, start a new career, and that bumps you back to stage two. Now you have to explore, find something new for yourself again to commit to. Maybe you're in stage four, but the thing you worked on becomes obsolete. The, these stages are very fluid and they, they kind of evolve throughout our lives. It's not that we go in a straight line, it's we kind of age in a loop-de-loop, -loop, if that makes sense. But basically it's just understanding that we're all going through these tensions and these struggles and that none of us is actually free of them and that we all do the things that we do because we think they're the right things. What feels right at stage four will feel completely wrong at stage two and what feels right at stage three will feel completely wrong at stage one. These, things, these tensions happen within society and it prevents us from understanding each other. So ultimately, to me, the stages of life just help us be a little bit less shitty to each other. And that's always a good thing. Fucking flies. Dude, it's days like these where I just wanna like gas bomb this entire area to murder these flies. <laughs>